their company and uh, their ideas on Locust Road uh, for conversations with the street committee, as I mentioned earlier. So we have Jeff Shook and his team. Jeff, we'll turn it over to you and let you introduce your team and go. All right, thank you very much. Um, my name is Jeff Shug. I'm with McClure Engineering Company. Um, I head up our transportation group uh, within McClure. And I've got two people. I'll have them introduce ourselves and then we'll get started. Hi, uh, my name is Bruce Van. Oh. Hi, my name is uh, Bruce Vansigal. Born and raised in Wacombe, Iowa. I currently reside in Fort Atkinson. Uh, live and work out of my home there from McClure Engineering. Been working with them for 10 years. Uh, moving forward, I'd be highly uh, involved in the design plan production phase of this. Um, good evening. Uh, uh, Bushan Karanik. Uh, I'm a senior project manager with McClure Engineering in the North Liberty office. Um, um, been with them for about a year before that I was at the Iowa DOT as a staff engineer for District 4 down in southwest Iowa mm -hmm. and uh, been doing transportation projects for about 18 years now. So, Could you say your first name again, please? Bushan. Bushan? Yeah. Thank you. First slide there. This is, this is the exact same thing that's up yeah, there. Yeah, I just thought it'd be easier if you had something in front of you and instead of craning your neck trying to look at the screen. Um, we had done some work uh, uh, previously taking a look at Locust Road and we had essentially broken it down into kind of four sections. Um, the first of those sections, go to the next slide there, go to the next one and we'll come back to that one. Um, the first section is what we call the urban section um, where we proposed a trail on one side of the street and a roadway with actual curb and gutters. Um, the probable construction cost for that section, it's about, it's from College Street to Shady Lane and it's about a 1,100 foot length section <laughs> and uh, the pr probable construction cost we estimated on that was about four hundred and sixty to five hundred and forty six thousand dollars. Um, the next section that we looked at is uh, the first of the rural sections. Um, this is where the corridor is a little bit more constrained and we're, we're having to put the bike trail up against the road and provide some kind of a, a barrier there in between the two. Um, that section is 1,500 feet long, Shady Lane Drive to Pinecrest Drive. Um, probable construction cost on that section that we looked at, 736000 to about 828000 um, The next section um, is actually two sections in between that previous one where it's a rural section where we have a, a wider right of way and more room where we could separate the trail um, from the roadway itself and then begin to try to incorporate some of the uh, water management techniques that were outlined in the report that the University of Iowa did for you guys a, a couple of years ago. Uh, so we can look at the bioswales on the sides and, and some other techniques. Um, that section, Shady Lane Drive to Pinecrest Drive, it's about a 2,000 foot section in there and again it's kind of separated into two pieces with another section. Um, probable construction cost on that, um, 983,250 to about a million one. And then the last section is uh, that very northmost section where the roadway is in somewhat better condition where we feel like just a mill and overlay um, would be the right course of action there. So that's from Pinecrest Drive to Laurel Drive. And again, we'd be adding the trail and incorporating those uh, water techniques out of the report into the bile swales to try to get some infiltration. Um, looking at a construction cost there of about 1.5 million to about 1.8 million. So a total project to get it all completed, um, we're estimating it to be about 3.7 million to 4.3 million um, to get the whole thing done. Um, could you go back to those color slides with the cross sections? There we go. That's right. We did look pretty extensively um, at what the University of Iowa had put together. So we're looking at potentially two different systems, um, one being a bioswale that we could use along the roadway. I think there's some areas where you're not going to get a lot of infiltration because there's a lot of rock out there, especially through that bluff section. So in those areas, we looked at um, an intake system that would actually gather that water store it temporarily and then allow it to go down into the ground slowly um, in an in a isolated manner where we might have to maybe drill a shaft or, or something in order to, to get that out of there. Those are techniques that we'll explore. Um, we're going to have to you know, measure that against cost as to how much of that you guys really want to implement because um, those techniques can get expensive. But we have looked at other projects, one particularly here in Clinton, or in Clinton that we're uh, looking at now 
and uh, projects further south and, and that were done out of our Missouri office. Another thing that we think might be helpful through this corridor is uh, what's called a joint utility trench. You guys have a lot of overhead utilities that are running through that corridor and really kind of clog it up as far as trying to widen it out and implement some of these techniques. What we've done in several communities um, when we're doing a major reconstruction project is the city can install what's called a joint utility trench. And you set that up so that you have individual conduits that would be for the electric. Um, uh, the gas usually goes in as a part of that all the telecommunications, all of the internet service providers um, are able to go into that joint utility trench where we can isolate those each within their separate tube in an area that's maybe, depending on how much electric is there, you know, somewhere between two feet wide and six feet wide and have that all buried within the corridor as a part of the road project. Typically we've been successful in negotiating with those utility companies that if the city pays for the installation of it, those utilities will, for free, move themselves down into those conduits and not charge you for the moving of their lines as long as, as you've installed the, the conduit. Because they see it as a benefit, it's storm hardiness, you know, it, it, you don't have the lines get blown down if a power pole gets, you don't have it get hit by a car. So it allows you to protect those utilities a little bit more and clean up the corridor a little bit overall. So that's not something that we suggest that you have to do, but it's just something we wanted to bring up as a part of, of potentially doing the project. Um, let's just, uh, move forward on. Um, we also looked at uh, what we think would be a really good intersection option at uh, Locust Road and College Drive. Um, that intersection has a lot of skewed angles that come into it. And while it's a four-way stop, your sight distances and sight lines, and it going through it a couple of times here today even, it's, it can be somewhat of a mess when traffic is busy. We think it's a really good candidate for a roundabout option, um, which would smooth that traffic flow out and provide pr potentially a much safer intersection. Um, the roundabouts, what they really do is prevent head-on and T-bone crashes because all the traffic is constantly circling through those intersections in the same direction. So it takes what could be a head-on crash or a side swipe or a T-bone and really makes the only potential type of accident that can happen is just a, a side swipe, which is the safest. If you're going to have an accident, that's the safest type of accident to have. Um, but you know, it's not something that, that we are saying that you, you have to do, but I think it's something that you should at least take a look at um, as part of the project moving forward. And again, reduced accidents, slower speeds, um, you never have a, a signal to maintain because you can do those without signals. And then just safer overall for pedestrians that would be going through the area as well because those speeds through the roundabout are getting down to 20 miles an hour. At 20 miles an hour, a pedestrian hit by a car has about a 10 to 15 percent chance of being severely injured or killed. When those speeds get up to 35 miles an hour or even 45 miles an hour, it gets to be 80 percent to 100 percent. So the slower speed it's just safer overall. Uh, go ahead to the next one. About that too. Pardon me? Um, where would pedestrians cross if it was a roundabout? At the four legs. And you don't have a pointer, so I'm just going to kind of walk up yeah. here. And it's unfortunate to do that. Um, you set it up through these islands. There's a little bit of an island that comes off of each leg of the roundabout. And then what you're able to do is you cross only one leg at a time. So at the time that you're crossing this leg, you only have to look for traffic in one direction, get to the safe ref refuge in the island, and then you only have to look for traffic coming in one other direction as you cross that second piece. And do you recommend that like, traffic travel like cars in a roundabout or like a pedestrian? Yes. Like a car? Yeah. Well, the estimated cost be of a potential roundabout? Yeah. Well, the cost be of a potential roundabout. It depends on size. Um, the size that we're looking at here being it's only a two lane, you're probably looking at 750,000, but you'd have some intersection improvements there anyway. So it's not a full $750,000 increase. It's maybe 300 to 400,000 increase for the roundabout. So does that total construction cost include the intersection? We did not because we weren't sure. Sometimes we propose roundabouts and we get run out of the room. <laughs> and sometimes we propose roundabouts and people are at least open to exploring the idea. And I was just so. going to say, for the sake of disclosure, I did not lead them <laughs> in any way. <laughs> All right, let's go to, go to the next one. 
Um, potential funding sources, uh, just going through our, our, our normal means, we're looking at um, through your RPA, um, there's the potential to get some STB, GP, they keep changing these acronyms, um, surface transportation block grant funding. Um, that's something that you have to apply for through your RPA and it's usually two or three years out, although sometimes you can, you can kind of sink that in years if somebody else has a project they want to want to move back. Um, state rec trails and fed rec trails, um, those are options for the, the trail component as a part of the project. Um, there's no trail through that area now, so I think it'd be a good, good candidate to maybe bring in some of those uh, trail dollars to handle the trails piece. Um, TIF is always something that you can do, but you got to have some kind of increment that you create within that corridor and, and have it in a TIF district. So I don't know if that's an extremely viable one um, for this particular roadway, but it, it is something that we've done a lot of funding for road projects with. Um, assessments are always a part of it, and I always tell everybody they're they're very difficult to do if you don't have any history of them. I don't know what your history is, history. but I saw <laughs> yeah. the conversation here, and believe me, yours was tame compared to some that I've seen on other projects. Chad's been with me on a few in Adel over the years that were a little bit noisier than that even. Um, U-STEP, um, there's about a max of 400,000 we could get through that program. And then with the roundabout component in there, especially at that intersection, reducing emissions of cars sitting at the intersection, there might be some possibility for ICAP um, because you're uh, reducing those exhaust emissions. And then just standard traffic safety improvement program um, is another method um, beyond the local dollars. And usually we try to combine a lot of different funding sources into a project if we have time to do that. Um, I see this as a multi-year project. I don't think it's one that you're going to go implement the whole thing in one shot. Um, so we'd have that time frame in order to do that. Um, going on to the next one. And here I'm going to switch topics on you a little bit because this is something that uh, we just looked into and, and kind of found interesting. Um, looking at uh, population change, and we tried to pick several towns that have colleges and then several other towns and anyway, I was able to get I think three in there, Marshalltown, Newton and Spencer um, that don't happen to have a college. And we just looked at change in population from 1990 uh, to 2015 and then what that percent change was. And one thing that we noticed is in Decorah um, your 1990 to 2015 change was actually a negative 2.1 percent versus most of the other towns with colleges. Waverly was a plus 15, um, Grinnell was even a plus 1.8 and they have a real issue because of property values being so high there it's very expensive to live in Grinnell. Um, Pella was a 9.4 Oskaloosa, I made this way too small, 7.7, uh, .7. Mount Vernon about 20%, Indianola about 39, and that's right by the metro, so that's you know a little bit of an outlier. And then uh, Spencer had a, which doesn't have a college, um, was about uh, minus 0.5%, and then Storm Lake was a little bit over 20. So anecdotally, or anecdotal, forget I'm trying to say that word, <laughs> anecdotally, um, we think there's there's probably a lack of, of housing available in your community. Not that, that people don't want to live here, but there just isn't enough housing for them to often be able to buy a house. And so if we flip to the next slide, we wonder if, and we're not suggesting, I guess this is just as our, our suggestion is, along with making improvements to Locust Road, you may want to look at trying to get some additional connector roads into kind of what we see as your future residential area to the north um, where Locust Road uh, you can see starts at the little number six where we propose the roundabout and then goes up but uh, through a transportation study that we did for you guys uh, recently we looked at three other potential corridors um, number one, the, the south connection, which would be that blue line that would come up from the south from an existing street and get into that area. Um, the west-southern connection, which is number two, which is the yellow one that comes in uh, from the west. And then the west-northern connection, which is the red one that comes in kind of from the same direction but a little bit further north. And then some of those north-south ones that were maybe more into the future area. But you know, it was part of maybe getting some additional housing to, to take root here and, and maybe turn the tide a little bit on that population 
loss, you know, you might want to look at some transportation opportunities along with Locust Road that would open up more area for potential development. So I think I've run my 15 minutes, so it's your yeah, turn to ask us questions. 15 minutes of questions. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank you. Yeah. Questions might you have from the floor? Do you have an idea of the amount of expense that's added because we're interested in looking at trails along this route? T trails run, if it's a separate trail, we've tracked this cost a lot because we've done a lot of trail work and we've got a lot going on up in Plymouth County with the plywood trail in different areas. But trail on its own is about a million dollars a mile, and that includes the grading. If, because if you're putting it with the street component, it takes a, a, that grading piece out. So you're probably down into the 650 to maybe $700,000 a mile for just the trail piece itself. It's definitely cheaper when you combine it with a road project because you kind of get that grading done for free as a part of the road project. And what is that distance from Laurel down to the intersection of Locust and uh, College? That's not true. Right. a mile. Yeah. From Pinecrest to. Uh, oh, I was looking at from Laurel, so it's a little further to Laurel. Pinecrest to College Drive is what? Point nine. Point nine. Point nine. Point nine. And to that point, the. Uh, Let's see, you've got uh, it's sidewalks on both sides. We showed a bike trail on one and a the sidewalk bike. on the other. And that's going from Shady Lane up to Pine? Correct. Okay. Flip back to that first cross section. Okay, Shady go forward. Shady Lane to Laurel. Go okay. forward. Shady Lane to, okay, we only show a trail on that Shady yeah, Lane piece because that corridor is constrained through there. That's where your, yeah. your right of way is constrained. Yeah. Go to the next. We show only a bike trail there. Only a bike trail there. Actually, we only show a bike trail through the whole corridor. So. Okay. Actually, we should call it a multi-use path okay. it's because when you put it in the corridor like that, you're going to have walkers, joggers, bikers, all they combined. on one side? Correct. So your blue southern connection, mm -hmm. it goes from Highland? I believe so. Down, and where does it come out? Can you get to that map, Sean? Talking about this. Very end. There you go. Look at that comes out on Ridge Road about the president's house. Correct. Yep. Do you go through the living room or how do you? <laughs> <laughs> Again, those, those are uh, planning level drawings. We haven't done any <laughs> actual corridor development through there. So. But a connection through that area, I think, would be beneficial. But did you look at Ridge Road, how improvements need to be done to make that even? And again, this was all high. I mean, we haven't That's dove in depth on, on these connections. We've looked at them enough to know that they're physically possible to do. The politics of whether you can do them or not are a step that we have not taken. Mm -hmm. And that's why we propose multiple connections is because you can't rely on just one until you get through that political piece of the discussion to determine which one's going to work. So for example, too, if the council were to choose number one, that south connection, that blue one, it might be in concert with some section of Locust Road. Correct. Right. One thing we've got some concern about is while Locust Road is under construction, there's very limited access to get into that north area. And so well, I think you could probably do that piece that's closest to, to college and get through it because you've got another street that you can find your way around the back side to come back down. 
but once you get past that point it gets Anywhere. pretty desolate mm -hmm. as far as additional connector streets and so that's you know I'm not saying do one or the other I think you might you know combine the two together over a series of years in order to accomplish it but having that additional road to connect to Locust especially further to the north on maybe number three which is the red one that would provide that second connection point out as you work on those other sections of the roadway because otherwise you end up having to do the roadway half and half with you know signals allowing one-way traffic and that just ex escalates cost exponentially when you start having to do that where you have the red there is actually no road at all anymore. correct yep. so you'd be paying for the road to access be able to do local but with the, with the argument that we may already need another yeah. exactly. access to that. And that opens up area for potential residential to get more people living in Decor. And you have these colored lines because you've discovered that the grades are possible to do yeah, transportation? We, we did a study for you as the city and I don't know how much of that got disseminated to you but we looked at several different options of how to get additional roadways into that area so we were able to verify we used LIDAR instead of actual ground survey but we were able to verify that it's physically possible to get them in there. We've only had a staff level readout of that first report we haven't reported out to the full council yet. <coughs> Well, some of this isn't even city limits, correct? I mean, it's in five metal arc. And some of it's way north, right? Yeah. Future five city limits, mm -hmm. correct? Metal arc, is it not? Yeah, the top five. The top, the top, top five, five. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Which we have discussed before. This is just good to think about. Right. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Food for thought. Yep. Any other questions? Um, Actually, and eight is about the end with the anticipation right. with that trail going up, I'm looking at the rural section at the bluff that's 10 feet wide. Mm -hmm. That's then wide enough for a truck to drive up there and plow that if there's. Yeah, a that's the section Bouchon with the uh, guardrail. Yeah, this section here. Um, yeah, um, the roadway there is full. 24 feet plus an additional four foot shoulder that's paved on each side before you get to the barrier and then the bike. So we've allowed for a little bit of extra width there. But I mean, the thought being uh, like a city plow, a uh, truck plow could go up there and plow right. that trail out separately. Yeah. yeah, a pickup truck could. Right. Uh, you wouldn't yeah. want right. <laughs> one of your snow plows on That's it. Kevin. <laughs> that would be Kevin doing that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what happens when you leave the meeting early. <laughs> I'm what, just looking at that. I'm How curious, what kind of impact it? do you estimate would, would um, it have to almost close uh, to the Would it be on all, all of the trees up and down that corridor just yeah. in the rural area, I guess, particularly the light blue uh, section? What kind of impact will it have on the, the greenery and the... It's all dependent on how close they are to where the construction's taking place. Um, driving through that several times, you've got trees that are in the right of way, and you're, you're going to get into those root systems as a part of reconstructing that road, unless you try to stick with something that's just a surface treatment only, in which case you wouldn't get into them because they should already be established underneath that roadway. But I'd be lying to you if I said that there's going to be zero impact. There's going to be some impact to, th to those trees just by the construction process. Um, some of those trees need to come out because that's why the ice doesn't melt because mm. we're getting black ice there because it doesn't get any sun. I, but I'm not an engineer. Mm. Yeah. And one of the big concerns with this area was just water runoff. Um, and you feel these plans have, have addressed that adequately? Again, we're, we're at the more than preliminary okay. level it. at this point. Okay. I mean, we don't have the benefit of any um, you know, soil borings in the area to see what's underneath there. Sure. You know, so it's it really until you get into the design process and you can start having those you know, more intensive investigations as to what's in there, it's hard to determine how much you're going to be able to get to soak into the, into the ground or not. Is there any thought to 
getting to sunset and then diverting over toward the blue line coming down as exactly. a trail as opposed to all with the trail. And not doing the trail all the way up locust. I mean that's a that's a possibility. Yeah. You're talking about trail the shady? Trail to Shady and then go the up blue line up right. the island. Right. And the question would be, is there going to be some larger, and we haven't had a chance to explore this yet, that's something we'd want to talk to your RPA about, but is there some larger plan north of Locust where there's going to be trails that you would want to make a connection to? If there is, and I'd say you'd want to go the full length on Locust, but if there isn't, diverting it back into that more residential area right. would probably that's be, my thought, would make more yeah. sense. I was going to say, why don't we either do all of it or none of it? It doesn't really make sense to me to just do that if we're going to try and spur development up there. I think it makes sense to do the whole thing. If not, I well, to have a connection to it, but I don't know about up Locust to get to it. That's my thing. And I could argue it one way or the other. I mean, yeah, sure. I, oh, well, I, I could give you a good, solid argument for both ways. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think it's a decision, but, and again, that's more of a political decision than it is an engineering decision. But it'd be good to know the strengths of mm -hmm. each of those as we make decisions of what we're going right. to do. Yeah. And you could always set it up so that it would be very easy to pave a trail in the future by just providing the graded portion where it, where it would go on, yeah. but then divert the money for the paving maybe off into a different direction to make a different connection now, knowing that if all you had to do was come back and put the asphalt or put the concrete down, you didn't have to do all the grading and the draining structures and everything else that goes yeah. as, as with associated with a trail. You know, it's a lot easier to, to maybe skip that portion now because you know you can pretty cheaply fill it into the future. So. And it could be a shovel ready, shovel ready project for grants. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Especially if it's all graded and ready to go. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Anything else we will be discussing later? Did we use up our whole half hour? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Close, so. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you guys. We didn't anticipate it. It's something that you could definitely take a look at. Um, I don't know if you're talking about a, a center common left turn lane or a passing lane like what you see in some of the steeper sections on the two lane highways that the DOT has done lately where you have a, a lane where the slower traffic is supposed to move mm -hmm. over so the speedier traffic can go through there. You've got the room in the corridor. It just takes additional construction and through that bluffs area in particular it would be more rock removal and, and so it, it, it might be an expensive option but it's definitely something that you could look at and make a decision as to whether you wanted to pay for it or not. Do you have an idea of the time each section might take as well? Until we know what construction technique for sure it's going to be, it's hard to say. We usually like to try to set projects up so that you're going to get through one construction season and complete it. I, I don't like to have something sit over the winter with traffic control all over the place because it's just it's dangerous to do that through the winter. So we try to size the projects to fit in one season so that we don't have that carry over into winter and then trying to pick it back up. So it, it might break down into smaller sections than, than how we presented it here just in order to make that work and potentially to line up with their budget as well. Mike's kind of question. I got a question. From uh, Shady to Pinecrest, where you have the guardrail up, uh, I know Dan talked about getting the snowplow in there, but is the snowplow going to be ideal in that situation with your back slope right there on the hillside? I mean, you're basically going to be pushing up a hill. It's going to be going right back down on your trail. A lot of the trails get plowed with a small pickup truck. I, I, real, I realize that, but you also you have shoulders on each side, or here you have 
no hitch. I mean, aren't you more looking at something with a snow plow or a snow blower or something like that to get that out of there? Then you're also going to be getting snow from the roadway itself. It, it, it could be, it, but I mean, we're we're at like zero design point right now. Yeah. So those are detailed questions that, that come along with the part of the design. So. Mike, you got one quick? I have a question. Thank you. So uh, at this point in your preliminary design, are there any, does this include any cost for property acquisition or new right of way whatsoever? Right now we've anticipated that we're going to be in the right of way because okay. it's wide enough, especially when it comes out to 100 foot. We haven't estimated the impact of maybe temporary construction easements that we would need because without the benefit of design, I can't even begin to determine the first one. But the 4.3 million upper end estimate is not included. And again, that's a, that is a very preliminary estimate based on no survey, no engineering, just a concept plan put together and historical costs from similar projects that we've used. So do you anticipate the costs going up? I can't even answer that. <laughs> Thank you. In our business, prices don't tend to go down. <laughs> so <laughs> that much I have. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are we supposed to call him? <laughs> yes, yeah. We're swapping engineering. Uh, I think they're out there with Chad. Thank you, though. Thank you. Thank you. Is this the whippy dip portion of the meeting? <laughs> I mean, really? Somebody promised me ice cream. If you want it. Okay, we have Joe and Justine from NSA, so I'll let Joe introduce yourself to Justine. Uh, <laughs> 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 you guys want to come up here? Yeah, I'll, I will. Yeah, I'll show them what I want. Yeah, that was looking good. Do it, Joe. I like it. So, yeah, I'm Joel Singer with NSA. I've got a few handouts for you, so cool. I'll pass it over. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. Why don't you open the window? Let's get a little stuffy in here. Yes, uh, Joe Elsinger at the MSA Joe Professional yeah. Services. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. yeah. All right. It's yeah. Very, you have to get pretty close yep. to actually use it. <laughs> we'll get it. Yeah. All, all four of us will be talking, too. So uh, there'll be a little bit of movement. <laughs> Is there any singing and dancing involved? No. <laughs> no. no. I, uh, yeah. Should have put in that suggestion ahead of time. I could have worked up a number for you. Oh, these? <laughs> All right, so in the interest of time, we can uh, dive right in. The handout contains some information about Locust Road that we'll be referring to, some information about MSA that we'll also be referring to. So um, anyway, I'll jump right in. I'd, first of all, I'd like to thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to come up here um, and my three coworkers, who I'll introduce in just a second. Um, we've. We're really excited about this project, and we're really excited about, um, you know, potentially partnering with the city of Decora, uh, as we'll get into. So, next slide, please. All right. So, a little background on MSA. Um, we are a uh, full-service engineering firm, uh, about 325 employees, 16 offices across six states. So that's fairly decentralized. Um, and the reason we do that is we try to provide a you know, personal uh, local presence and combine that with the resources, you know, the, the higher technical resources of a, of a larger firm. So uh, like I said, we're kind of full service. We have engineering, architecture, funding, planning uh, services that we provide. Um, we're also 100% employee owned. Um, this is important to us. Um, all four of us are owners of the company. And we think that provides uh, more value to a client um, because we take a little extra pride in our work as a result. So, uh, next slide, please. All right, so 
As I mentioned, I'm Joe. Um, I'm team leader of our Cedar Rapids office. Um, I actually live in Strawberry Point. Um, I grew up in Northeast Iowa. I moved away. I missed it. I moved back. Now it's my home. It'll stay my home. Um, my wife works at uh, Upper Iowa University in Fayette. And um, next uh, with me is Brian Benjamin. Stand up if you would. Or, yeah, you're in front now, so you can wave. Um, Brian is a senior um, or a senior project manager um, on my team, and he's got about 20 years of managing really large, complex transportation projects like Locust Road would be. Um, and then he also is a, a trails enthusiast, personally. Um, Eric Thompson here. He leads our water resources practice in the company. Um, I regard him as an expert in all things stormwater and water quality, and uh, he's an avid cyclist as well. And then finally, we have Kevin Ruland. Um, he leads our traffic practice in MSA. So um, they'll each be talking a little bit about what they can brought, uh, bring to any any project. Um, so. Next slide, please. All right, uh, now we're going to switch gears and talk a little bit about Locust Road. Uh, next slide. So actually, um, we've been meeting with various city officials for quite a while about Locust Road. The first time I came and took a look at Locust Road with Eric Thompson, I think we might have met Chad, was February of 2014. Um, we've been here a few other times since then. Met with Ross, met with Kevin, met with Chad a couple times. Um, Locust Road is interesting to us because it's a complex, challenging project. Um, and uh, you know we're, we're interested in that kind of thing. So in listening to what Chad and Ross and Kevin have said to us, there's really four main components that we see integral to uh, a successful project um, in the eyes of the city. And those are multimodal transportation, stormwater management, schedule and project staging, and then of course funding. So, and we'll work through those in the next few slides. So. With that, I'll hand it over to Kevin, and he'll start talking a little bit about the transportation challenges of this project. Thanks, Hope. Joe's a little taller than me, but I'll try to make this work, so. Um, yeah, a little bit just on the transportation side of it, and the slides are in your packet if you haven't found them yet, so you can kind of follow along there as well, and you got the other screen, but. Um, ADT, most recent ADT counts out there in the 4,000 range. We know there's growth planned on top of the hill, residential, different mixes of density of residential uses up there. So we know there's gonna be more traffic. Seems to be mostly coming down the hill in the morning and going back up in the afternoon. So that, that creates a little bit of a challenge for a road with that kind of ADT where there's uh, more congestion than you might expect because it's so directional, directionally split in the morning and the afternoon. And we see that play out a little bit at the intersection of College and, and Locust. And we'll talk a little bit more in detail on that on the next slide. But um, we also know there's some safety concerns there with pedestrians. Uh, and with crashes in general, we know there's been a few crashes. The sight distance as you come down the hill and try to look over the bridge and to the left is pretty tough there. So um, those are things we want to try to address and, and work with the community on um, and trying to make sure we're getting the right mix of, of, of things as we, as we work to fix it. There also is a uh, 11 by 17 handout in the back of that packet that shows a couple of different cross sections um, to try to accommodate things like the pedestrian and bicycle amenities that we understand you're interested in adding and also deal with some of the right-of-way or physical constraints of the environment out there. Now, there's all kinds of different cross-sections that could fit out there, but what we tried to do was take the narrowest section that might be out there based on the rock face on one side, and we've got the ravine or another rock face maybe on, on the other side of the road, and show how could we make some of what we know you're interested in fit. One of the sections shows a 40-foot wide section that tries to accommodate the vehicle traffic keep space for an, an off-road separated path because that provides a little bit of added safety um, and then also deal with all the stormwater issues that Eric's going to talk about when he gets up here. So trying to fit that in that tight 40-foot space is really is, is, is difficult, but that's what our job is here. If we can get to a 50-foot section in areas where it spreads out, then we've got more room to provide a little bit more space between different amenities and make those work. Again, we could, we could talk about what sections we think fit the be different areas of the project best, but until we get some actual field survey and talk to you more about how you value those different aspects of the process, pr 
project, we didn't feel it was appropriate to get into that much level of detail yet because we want to make sure the pieces fit with what you're really looking for. It was just an intent to show you here's the tightness that we've got up here and here's how we could possibly see that working. So um, construction staging and detours, obviously that's a, that'll be a challenge. There's some limited access points up there as far as some of the residents. That's their primary way in and out of town. How do we stage that and how do we work with the cost and the funding as well to try to maximize the value there? Uh, next slide. So a little bit about the intersection is, as Joe mentioned, I'm the traffic lead for MSA. So this is kind of my, where I get excited about projects. Um, um, Brian did a little digging for me and found that there had been about ten crashes in the la uh, seven crashes in the last ten years, and three of those are failure to, failure to yield, which means people aren't stopping and, and, and taking their turn there. We looked at two different options here, just conceptually. One being a roundabout. MSA has, is a nationally recognized expert in roundabout engineering. We have a firm of, of, of a group of twelve individuals that this is all they do, and they've designed roundabouts across the country, and they've come up with a concept that definitely has some impacts here that we would be. Uh, we would want to make sure you're comfortable with. There's obviously a big hill there where, where some of the impacts are and trying to make that fit and provide the operational benefits that a roundabout can provide is, is a challenge but definitely has great operations, uh, benefits for safety, benefits for pedestrians that uh, we can talk more about. Um, there's also a traditional intersection option there depending on how signal warranting plays out and maybe you've studied that in the past, maybe you haven't, but uh, we've got some concepts for that as well in terms of how to figure out. And again, once we collect traffic volumes, work with you on what property impacts are uh, acceptable, which ones are not acceptable. We heard a lot of good feedback tonight from different individuals about how passionate they are about their properties. We, we want to make sure we're taking that into consideration before we just say, you know, this is the right fit for you. We, we need your input as well. So. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Eric, and he's going to get more into the details on the storm sewer. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. So just like Kevin has his uh, drawings and pictures, I've got mine too. Um, again, just like Kevin, I lead a group of nine folks, and all we do all day long, every day, is water resources and stormwater engineering. So you know, we tend to kind of get lost in the details. And I think in a situation like this, stormwater is at one instance a detail, but it's also a really important consideration because while what you've got out there right now is not ideal, it would be ironically really easy to make it worse. So if you look at the slides that I've got up there, there's, there's actually three images in front of you. Um, the one on the left is just a simple watershed map, and it kind of shows that the drainage coming through the corridor is roughly shaped like a balloon, and you've got this large bulb at the top, which is generating about half of your runoff, which then has to be conveyed down the street you know, not quite to the bottom of the hill, you know, we shunt off to the uh, ravine on the east side there at some point, but we're carrying as much flow through the street as the street itself generates. So you're kind of dealing with a lot of stuff going on upstream. Well, if we were to convert this to a traditional uh, curb and gutter section and, and want to put that into storm sewer and carry it down the street instead of along either side of the street, some interesting things go on. Um, a, a typical street section that could fit in there uh, in the corridor that Kevin described, it can take about 80 cubic feet per second flowing at curb depth. Um, and the thing that's important about that is, you know, you think, oh, it's a storm sewer street. Well, the water just goes in the storm sewer. Well, the thing is it has to accumulate before it can be caught by the, in by the inlets and then brought down in the pipe. And there's a certain acceptable amount of depth that a typical street design would allow you to have, which is going to be between two and three feet at the curb line, depending upon how wide your pavement section is. Well, if you look at the, the um, middle image, you can see right now where water comes across uh, at about three locations, depending upon how big the storm is, it actually comes out of the ditch and across the pavement, drops back into the other side, comes back to the other side, and, and you know, kind of crisscrosses the street. Well, the flows in those instances, I'm expecting, are probably fairly wide and fairly shallow, and because they're going across the road as opposed to down the road, they're not real high velocity. But when we start thinking about converting the cross section, maybe having curbing down there, and I'm not saying that there would be, but just suppose we are, you're going to be conveying all that water into the street where it's going to stay. And that image on the far, far right is some really old data that the U.S. Department of Interior put together which shows that flooding risk is actually not just a question of how deep the water is, but how fast the water flows. You've got about a 6% grade going down the average of that street. That can get you almost 10 feet per second. You know, a U.S. Uh, Olympic swimmer 
can swim about three feet per second, or six feet per second, excuse me, two yards per second. So, I mean, this stuff is just screaming down there. And the smaller your body is, so you go from a, an adult male to an adult female to a child, it takes less and less depth before it's going to sweep you off your feet. And you can actually create kind of a dangerous situation out there. So in this instance, a little bit of the details of the stormwater kind of uh, could dictate a lot of the considerations for how we're going to do this design. Are we going to go to a curb and gutter section? Are we going to retain some type of uh, roadside swale or ravine style drainage? Because it's going to be an important concern just for the overall safety, especially if we're going to be trying to make this multimodal and Im increase the biking traffic or the pedestrian traffic. So next slide, please. So the obvious thing you want to do is have less water. And the way we do that is you put in some detention or some infiltration and things like that. But as you all know, you've got some pretty unique uh, bedrock topogra topography around here. You've got uh, limestone, fractured limestone, karst, you've got sinkholes. And in many, many areas of the country, uh, having stormwater management in areas where you've got fractured bedrock or we've got sinkholes uh, can be really tricky because there's sometimes some prohibi prohibitions against infiltrating stormwater into the bedrock at a rapid pace for fear of contaminating groundwater. So the idea of just throwing a detention pond out there and cutting those flows way down and then not having so much to convey down to the bottom, doing some so outside the right-of-way improvements, you know, there's, there's some hooks on that. You can't just sort of throw it out there willy-nilly and say you're going to do it just because of the unique situations you've got here in Decora. So the map is pretty, ex <laughs> pretty uh, intimidating in that the whole entire project corridor is either listed as karst or it's listed as, you know, uh, but, uh, uh, um, um, sinkholes, so it's, it's highly soluble as well. So interesting challenges you've got here. That's kind of the end for me. I'll give it to Brian for the next slide, if you don't mind. Thank you. Thank you. Brian and I'm the short guy so I will move the mic. Uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about the schedule. So this project has so many challenges and complexities and issues and opportunities that we are looking at the first part of the schedule to be the functional design part where this is where we're going to collect all the data, the survey, go through some of the environmental review uh, uh, information and the forms through that. Um, the geotechnical investigation, figuring out, yeah, we know it's karst, but what exactly is it we're dealing with? And, and trying to get all those pieces put together and then start the conversation between us and the city to, uh, to figure out exactly what it is that we can actually create and put together with this. If we get it figured out in the beginning, that makes the design process a lot easier through the whole way through. So we're looking at between the end of this summer and all the way through till uh, next February to, to be able to just uh, kind of hammer that design down and figure out what is it that we're, we're, we're looking for? What is our end goal? Um, from there then we would go into the final design which will be a lot of uh, 2019. Uh, along with that is uh, uh, easements and property acquisition which can take a year uh, to be able to, to go through that. Plus the design itself is going to take a, a long time just to, to get all of these complexities and everything uh, with good solutions. Uh, then we are looking at doing our bid letting in early 2020 uh, would be our, our, our hope and uh, focus to, to get that. Next slide please. Now we have a couple of construction phase options. Now my understanding is that we still don't have quite exactly it down as to where we're going to. So we would look at it in three phases. We could have College Drive to Shady Lane Drive uh, the summer of 2020. Uh, that would include uh, some of the, the intersection work that uh, Kevin talked about. Then working our way up the hill. And that could actually even go a little past Shady Lane Drive because of that, that first area that Eric was showing with the stormwater coming across the road. Uh, we could try to catch that in that first phase. Uh, second phase then would be Shady Lane Drive up to Pinecrest Drive. Uh, that would be spring, summer of 2021. And then Pinecrest Drive up to Highland would be the third and final segment all the way up through the hill and all the way to the top. Um, we're talking summer, fall of 2021 and maybe extending into 2022 um, depending on the funding and, and how all the pieces fit together. Uh, the second option for construction would be to try to do it all in one season, uh, either 2020 or I think your federal funding is more for towards 2021. Um, that would minimize the duration of construction. We're not 
spreading it out over two or three years. Um, but during that year, it's going to be a greater inconvenience to the residents and the commuters that, that use the corridor. Um, but there's also some possible cost benefits that uh, administrative costs are less. If you have one project, you're, only, you're not coming back every year uh, trying to redo paperwork and all those kinds of things. And also, uh, contractors will typically give you a quantity discount. You know, the more project you have, maybe the price per unit uh, would come down a little bit too. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Joe, and I apologize for the mic level. <laughs> Talk about funding. Yeah. All right, any uh, questions thus far? I should have mentioned that in the beginning. I wanted to keep this more of a conversation, you know, um, because what you think is, at the end of the day, the most important. So we're throwing ideas around, but by all means, if you have any comments or questions, fire away. Um, so uh, the last main topic that we identified that was important to the city is, of course, funding. Now, um, MSA has a funding team that specializes in getting funds, seeking out and getting funds for our clients. Um, just on the right-hand side there, um, You'll see just in Iowa, we've gotten well over $50 million uh, of grant funds of various types uh, from um, the, uh, you know, from various sources just in the state of Iowa. As a company, I think we're over $500 million in grant funds for, for our clients. Um, so we're aware, you know, you have about $1 million uh, already awarded for this contract, or for, for this uh, project. Um, you know, I think it's College Drive to Pinecrest uh, is the latest uh, uh, allocation of money. Um, and about half of that uh, are state transportation block grant funds. Um, some of it is for 20, uh, fiscal year 2020. Some of it is for 2021. Uh, um, the city, Chad's mentioned, he, you know, the city does have geo bond capacity. Um, I know the city also has a special assessment policy that may come into play for various components of the project. Um, so uh, there are many other funding sources, um, and I don't want to, uh, you know, now is not necessarily time to go into detail on every single one of these, but um, it would be a good idea just to have a standalone meeting just to discuss fun funding, come up with a strategy for what we're going to count, what we would go after, you know, what is the highest odds, when are deadlines, how to get, you know, an application together. Um, so, for instance, stormwater management. You know, you have a stormwater utility that can be used to repay uh, a portion of the geo bond, um, but beyond that, um, stormwater best management practices. There are funds available for stormwater best management practices that are focused on water quality. I know that's important to the city. Um, you know, there's uh, some of them. You have to kind of work with uh, potentially the Upper Iowa um, Watershed Management Association, um, and there's funds that the DOT provides. Um, the state revolving fund loan program. Um, administered by IEDA has a low interest loan program specifically for water quality improvements um, and I've done projects involving these programs so that's just uh, stormwater now for instance trails and pedestrian features I know that's important to the city too um, there are a lot of funds uh, that can be applied for, or a lot of funding sources. Some of these funds are somewhat limited. You have to turn over multiple rocks, but it can add up. You know, um, there's transportation alternatives program with DOT. There's the CAT program uh, that we that you could apply for through IEDA. Those are grant funds as well. Um, State recreational trail funding through DOT, uh, the Winnesheet County Foundation. Maybe it's an uh, opportunity to apply for grant funds for a trail there. Um, local utilities, maybe they have funds available for um, the trail components. So uh, if you turn over a number of these rocks, I think you can find a number of viable funding sources. So, um, and lastly, just the general roadway construction. It's worth pointing out if you wanted to stage the project, um, 
you could potentially apply for additional STBG or state transportation block grant funds for subsequent phases. Um, that would spread out the schedule because usually those funds are allocated a number of years in advance, but um, that can ease the burden on the city. So, um, and I've worked on funded projects, you know, my entire career with MSA. So uh, that's something we take pride in. We know communities have limited resources. You need to find ways to pay for it. So particularly for a complex project like Locust Road, when you do that road, you want it to last, you know, this generation. Um, so what amenities do you want to build into there? You know, I'm sure trails, you know, a, a bike lane or a bike path is important. Stormwater management is important. Do it right and then, you know, let it let that serve as something to be proud of in the community. So next slide please. So we prepared a short visualization for Locust Road. Um, we flew the road with a drone and then um, kind of overlaid it with a concept. So if you can click play. Yeah, bottom left if you Ooh. There we go, yeah. So it's not real long because the file size is huge, but we have a longer video that we'd be happy to share with you. Um, but this is like a 30 second clip. So, you know, how we see it, you know, you have your project corridor, um, you know, the safest way to handle bicyclists is to separate them from the actual roadway. Um, make that wide enough to be, you know, to handle pedestrians and bike, bicyclists safely um, and, you know, and then have a, a corridor that can be used by everyone in the neighborhood. So, um, anyway, that was just a short clip. Um, I'd be happy to share the longer video with you. We probably can upload it and share a YouTube link or something like that. So, um, next slide, please. So, um, the last, uh, this is kind of the last main topic. No conversation about Locust Road is complete without talking about the cave. <laughs> you know, we, Eric and I thought, saw this, you know, the first time we were here in 2014. And what's that? That's pretty cool, you know. Uh, per Decor News, it was used for storing dynamite, uh, you know, in the original road construction. Um, I want to make a point of saying, you know, how. What, how do you see the cave, you know? Uh, it's easy for an engineer to say, oh, it's in the way, you know. Well, no, that's not the point. The city, you know, can do something with this if you choose. Um, the city can, you know, make this some kind of a landmark if you choose. Is it an engineering obstacle or is it a historic landmark? Um, we'd love to talk about how that could be incorporated in the design. So. Um, that's, and maybe it's a home patrol, so we shouldn't touch it. So. <laughs> so. <laughs> it's a fox gun right now. It's scary. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. next slide, please. So, uh, in summary, um, you know, we'd love to work with you on this project. Um, I'm passionate about my job. I'm passionate about providing a quality service. Um, what I think we bring to the table, as I mentioned, we're 100% employee owned. Um, full service firm, um, that means to you, you know, we take pride in our work and we can give you answers to the full range of questions that this project demands. Um, have a local presence. Um, I would be your primary contact. Um, ask around to neighboring communities that I work in. Um, I take pride in providing quality service and being responsive and identifying you know, what communities want and then giving it to you, uh, you know, fulfilling your desire. So, um, and lastly, uh, the reason we've been interested in it as a firm for so long, um, you know, we have a lot of respect for the city of Decorah. I personally really appreciate what you guys have done here. Uh, it's very impressive. Um, and we have a desire to partner with, you know, a vibrant, progressive community. So um, I think that's it. So next slide. And any questions or comments? Um, I'm curious about the, the, uh, the roundabout option. Um, 
I mean, it's it's one thing to have a. I mean, round, roundabouts. I don't mind them. I I do think they can help you with with traffic flow. Is it problematic though that we have a a very busy um, convenience store at that one quadrant with lots and lots of you know traffic turning real close to the roundabout? Yeah, I mean, we we've designed roundabouts with convenience stores, gas stations on corners before. That's not really a, a particular issue. Um, really what ends up being a bigger issue with those is how do they get their fuel supplied and, and in looking at how the site lays out you can see there's the three fueling manholes whatever they call them on the north side so they could pull in on the north side travel through the south side and, and then loop back around to get out or vice versa however they do that but the access points themselves being that close hasn't uh, is, isn't historically a problem just because the speeds are so slow in and around the roundabout that there's time usually for people to make those necessary moves it, it, worst case scenario you can provide um, especially maybe on the north leg there where there's probably a little bit more traffic uh, a, a lane there for for turners into it to get out of the through lane so that northbound traffic can continue through and they can pull out of the way but um, those are things that can be worked through pretty easily with the project and don't really create an issue with the operation of the intersection okay. do you guys have a cost estimate low end high end any general ideas um, on what you're thinking no we so the challenge with providing cost estimates is it's tied to the you know the width of the corridor like we provided a couple of concepts and to provide a really accurate cost estimate we want to be more precise exactly what you want to include you know providing a trail that's divided from the street is more expensive you know but there's a benefit to that there's a safety benefit to that um, so is that what you want you know how far you know curb and gutter would extend certainly you know up to shady lane a little beyond at the very least and then above that you might be able to get away with the rural cross section there's a cost impact on that um, roundabouts are somewhat more expensive up front um, they definitely have lower uh, you know maintenance costs and signalized intersections so maybe they can pay for themselves depending on you know uh, details um, so no, I mean, I, I've reviewed the cost estimates that were, you know, provided as part of the grant applications to the DOT. Um, you know, I think those were prepared maybe a few years ago, but um, it's ballpark. Um, and then we certainly can provide more detailed cost estimates, but there's, I really want to understand, you know, and make sure your priorities are represented before we throw out a number, you know, so. Um, I appreciate the attention to detail, yeah. including the yeah. cave. Yeah. Because <laughs> I wondered so. right away what are we going to do with that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So. So is that roundabout projected on this map to go into the bluff? Yeah. So on the southeast corner there, mm -hmm. it's shaded, so you can't really see, but there would definitely be an impact on the main property that would be impacted is that on the southeast corner. There's nothing there, but it's a bluff. Like there, there would have to be rock removals. It, it, you know, there would be a cost associated. Do you with have another that department out. that handles that? Yeah, we. So we have. I mean, Kevin's involved in, you know, as a traffic engineer. But we have roundabout specialists who right. I would absolutely bring. You know, if the city is serious about looking at a roundabout before you make a final decision. I would want to bring bring Ben Wilkinson here. He handles a lot of our roundabout designs in Iowa and have a conversation about pros and cons. And he, you know, he, he's great at what he does, and you can make an educated decision on that po at that point. So, yeah. Yeah. And just, just quickly to add to that, too, I mean, Ben actually put this together. So, you know, he designed, he's designed roundabouts in Dubuque and a lot of other places here. But, um, he makes some value assessments when he puts this together. He assumes that the vacant property, even with the bluff there, is less valuable than developed property and has less impact. Now, that may or may not be the case. If, if we, we can shift the roundabout around, but you're going to see impacts to other properties then to accommodate that. So it can be adjusted and moved. It's just, again, it's a value proposition as far as what the impacts are and where they're located. And you're bringing that sidewalk up the southeast corner so the crosswalk is quite a ways up what's locust now, right? 
Yeah, uh, and that's typical at a roundabout. They're about 20 to 20 to 25 feet back from the actual yield point where the vehicles would meet in a roundabout. That's to minimize conflicts in one particular location. So that's just, again, with the geometry out there, that's kind of how it fits together at, with this concept. You know, I'll put that caveat on anything. Yeah, I, I don't have that since I didn't lay it out, but um, I know it's conceptual. So yeah, is it big enough for a monument of the mayor? Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, we actually, yeah, that, it's interesting you touch on that because that's kind of one of. Ben's things he talks about is you want something in the center. Um, a lot of people think, oh, I want the intersection completely open so I can see all the way across it. With roundabouts, you actually want to channel people's vision so that they're not looking in the wrong direction. You know, they should be see they should be watching for oncoming vehicles, but you shouldn't be watching all the way across the intersect the roundabout. You don't need to worry about what they're doing over there. So, you know, he typically recommends you mound up dirt. You can put a sculpture there. You can put art there. Um, nothing too horribly distraction that people stacking up people are staring at it. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, that's one of many things that he brings to the table, or little things like that he talks about. So. Yeah, I think the only the only caveat to any of that is you don't want something that's a crash. Yeah, a crash hazard. Yeah. So, so we're looking at that instead of or hit it. Any other questions for so them? Do you think the stormwater segment of this is one of the largest perspectives to yes. deal with? Yes, and that's, you know, you can't just jump in and design College Drive to Shady Lane without looking at the stormwater for the entire corridor. And that's why, um, to reinforce the point, you know, I do think it's important to do what we call a functional design or preliminary design or a conceptual design. Don't get hung up on the words. It's to iron out all those details. Stormwater is a big one. Um, pedestrian and bicy bicycle features are another big one. Um, that's going to impact cost, you know, and in that preliminary design, we work out cost estimates for doing it this way or doing it that way. Um, and then when all those big details are taken care of, the rest of the project goes so much smoother. You know, right now, I, I, I've been paying attention. The city's been discussing this project for years and years and years. <laughs> and the reason is you don't have the information to make the decision. Okay. So, um, you know, provide you more information, pros and cons of each choice, and you can, you know, make um, an intelligent decision based on what you feel is important. Um, so that's, that's kind of how you know, we'd approach it. Thank so, you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Thank you. I think that that's all we have on the agenda. Motion to. So moved. Uh, <laughs>